Hey everybody, it's Lon Seibman, and you all know I'm a big production nerd when it comes to video hardware, so a lot of you who are following me for all of my adventures in do-it-yourself video production were curious about the Sling Studio, so I reached out to them and they let me borrow one of these for a month to play around with it, and I finally have a pretty good idea as to how it works and who this might be for. So we're going to be exploring this in detail in this review. I do want to though mention in the interest of full disclosure, that this is on loan from Sling, who makes the Sling Studio. When I'm done with this, it goes back to them. All the opinions you're about to hear are my own. Nobody is paying for this review and no one is reviewing this content before it is posted. So let's take a closer look now at the hardware. This is a four input video production switcher. It costs about $1,000, which might sound like a lot, but it's competitive with a number of other video switchers in this class of products. So I'm thinking about the Blackmagic ATEM Television Studio. That's about $1,000, as is the Cerebro Live Wedge, uh, both of which we've looked at here on the channel in the past. Now, what's unique about this one uh, versus those other two I just mentioned is that your input signals come in, for the most part, wirelessly to the device. They come in through a smartphone that's compatible with it, so the iPhones all work with it, as well as a few Android phones as well. There's a compatibility list down below and you can also have something plugged in directly via HDMI. There's a single uh, HDMI input on the side here and where I think this has some value would be for maybe a high school basketball game for example. You can have a uh, fixed camera up in the bleachers where you might usually have it but then you could send people out with iPhones for example to go and interview players on the court live that you can stream out to your production. Really cool concept here that uh, this will enable through a couple of different ways and uh, that to me I think really sets it apart from some of the other devices. It's not going to be though for everybody. I don't think it's going to be great for game streamers because its support for 60 frames per second is a bit limited. I'll talk about that more in a minute, but I think for institutions like schools and uh, religious institutions that are looking for uh, some ways to spice up their live feeds and recordings, this might allow you to do that because it really uh, only requires a phone to give you a remote camera, at least a phone that's compatible. And that to me is really compelling and I'll show you how all of that works in just a second. But let's step through some of the uh, ports on here before we boot it up. Uh, there is a USB Type-C port here at the top and you can plug in an external hard drive for example. You can also plug in an Ethernet device to, to get yourself out to the network via Ethernet which will give you a more reliable stream for example. Uh, one of the things that you can get for this is a hub that gives you both Ethernet and USB ports so you can do Ethernet and uh, your hard drive at the same time but there is a uh, SD card slot here on the front for recording too so you don't need to do that but I do always recommend if you can connect your streaming device to Ethernet, it'll give you a much better connection for your viewers. Now there is an HDMI input on the back of the device here, but uh, know that if you do plug in something via HDMI, uh, you're only going to have three other wireless input sources that you can put into it. So for total, you can have one HDMI and three wireless sources, or no HDMI and four wireless sources. The choice is yours, but just know you're only going to get uh, four in any configuration. This port supports 1080i, 1080p, 30, and then it goes down to 720p and some lower resolutions also. Uh, there is a scaler built in, so it will de-interlace the video for you automatically. So it's generally been working with uh, most of the HDMI devices that I have plugged into it. Now, if you do want to go remote with a camcorder, for example, they offer an option for you to do that, which will cost you a little more money. Uh, this is their camera link add-on. This is another $350 investment you have to make per camera. But what it does is it locks onto your uh, shoe mount and you can then plug in an HDMI cable from your camera here. So there's a little micro HDMI connector for the input here. And then you plug the uh, mini HDMI cable here into your camcorder. Most consumer camcorders have the mini HDMI out. If your camera has another type of HDMI connector, you'll have to get another cable, but I think it is a standard uh, HDMI cable, so HDMI big to HDMI micro, uh, you should be good to go there. Uh, so what you do is turn this thing on, it will automatically connect up to the uh, Sling Studio and start broadcasting whatever your camera is shooting, including the audio, back to the home base for you to stream back out, so you can get a better quality image out there. If you've got one of those cameras with a built-in XLR microphone, for example, it will work with that and you can get good audio from the field uh, while you're recording your game or something. I think that's again really cool for a high school to be able to do something like that.
that in real time without editing. That is just super cool to me. Problem with this, though, is that the battery is not replaceable on it. So you can't swap out the battery mid-production if you're doing a long recording, for example. Uh, so your only option here, if you go uh, beyond, it's probably about two and a half hour battery life is what I found in testing. Uh, you'll have to carry around a little USB battery with you that you can plug into the USB port here to supplement the onboard battery. But the good thing is it is USB power. Those batteries are easily found. Uh, but just know you can't just swap it out like you could do the camcorder battery uh, during the course of your production. So a little pricey for this device, but uh, it does seem to work pretty well, and we'll be testing this out in our little review here in a few minutes. But if you did want to bring in a 60 frames per second HDMI source, you would use this box to do it. So this is your way to bring in 1080p 60, but there's no way to hardwire it uh, into its included HDMI port. So below that, you've got an HDMI output here, and they smartly put in a different connector here so you don't confuse the two. Uh, so this is a, a mini HDMI out that'll go out to uh, another recorder, for example, or you can have it go out to a monitor. You have the option of having the program go out, or you can have it give you a four-up view, uh, which you can put on a larger monitor, for example, while you're running your broadcast. But it'll all be switched from an iPad, and you'll get the same image on the iPad. Over here is a line input for audio, and during my live stream, as I was testing this last week, and I'll put a link to that down below also, I was surprised that it really gets the audio synchronization pretty much done automatically. I was really quite impressed with that. I had uh, my iPhone connected wirelessly, and we did a few tests where I was talking into a microphone that was connected to the line input on this, and it was syncing my voice up to the iPhone video. There's no way to manually adjust the audio delay, and that's something that uh, you might encounter sometimes when you're bringing in sources digitally, but uh, in this case, it seems to be doing it automatically. Uh, so if it works, great. Uh, at least it did for me. But uh, just know I did not find any uh, audio delay controls built into the device. But maybe that's something they'll add in the near future. Uh, your power goes in there. But if you want to have it work completely wirelessly, there's also a battery option. This is a $150 add-on. But you got this big battery here that I will give you about three hours of streaming time just by snapping onto the bottom of the device here. It'll still give you a tripod mount here so you can mount it someplace to get a really good signal, uh, which you also have if the battery is detached. Now on the front of the device, you've got a power button and a few indicator lights. There's an internet light here to let you know you've got a healthy internet connection. And the way this works when you're out in the field is that you connect the box to the internet. All of your devices connect to the device itself here. And uh, it's got two Wi-Fi radios, one to do the communication to the internet, the other one to talk to your cameras. And it will route the internet as an access point through that direct connection. So when your iPad connects up to control it, if you need to pop out and check something on the web real quick, it'll get its internet through this without having to detach from this network and then go back to the host internet network there. So it's pretty smart about how it handles that. You got a recording light down below here, and below that is the SD card slot. Now, what they sent me for a card, which is probably the one I'm going to recommend to you, uh, is the SanDisk Extreme Pro. And this will allow you to not only record your program feed, the thing that you are broadcasting out to the world, but you can also uh, record each of the four camera inputs simultaneously in addition to the four up view. So you can have six different things uh, recorded at the same time, which I thought was a really cool feature because maybe you screwed something up during your live stream and when you upload the recording, uh, you want to fix that. You'll have four different camera angles that you can drop into your finished production if you want because they will all get recorded to the card at the same time. But the card needs to be fast enough to handle that load. Uh, so you can get a fast card or you can just plug in a fast enough uh, external hard drive to the USB-C connector to get all of that done. So now that we've talked about how this thing is configured hardware-wise, let's plug it in and see how it works. So I've got everything up and running now. The blue light at the top here indicates that the device is booted up and ready to start working for us. The internet light here is lit up, meaning that the Sling Studio has a connection to the internet. In this instance, I am connecting wirelessly via wireless AC to the internet, but again, you could use Ethernet if you choose to do that. Either way, it's happy with the connection that we have right now. By the way, it supports AC both for its internet connection as well as the camera connections back into it. Uh, the recording light is off at the moment, but we'll be turning it on shortly once I get all of my cameras hooked up to it. Now, I've got a video input source coming into the HDMI port on the 
Sling Studio. You'll see that in a minute. We've got a camcorder connected here with the uh, wireless adapter. I have an iPhone 6 over there that's going to be sending some video into this mix also. And we have the iPad connected up right now, which we'll be using to control everything. And once we get going, I'll add in the fourth input source, which will be this iPhone 7 Plus. So you can see what happens when a uh, camera joins the network. So I'm just going to pop up my uh, iPad view here so you can see exactly how all of this works. I set up a profile here ahead of time. I just wanted to show you what some of your options are. Um, so right now I've got it set at the highest possible quality, 16 megabits per second. And right now I have it set to record the program here, as you can see with that check mark, the quad view, which will give us a recording of all four cameras simultaneously with no sound. But I also have it looking at the video sources as well. So it's going to record uh, all four of those incoming video sources in addition to the line in audio if I decide to use that. I do recommend that you do a write test onto the card before you start to make sure that it can support all of those streams. So what it's going to do right now is just do a very quick test here to make sure that this card can do all the things we're asking of it. So the test is now complete and we've got a check mark here which indicates we can do six streams at once onto that card. It's only going to record five at the moment because we haven't added our fourth input source yet which we'll do in a second but uh, that is something you should do though is run that test before you get up and running here. Now I could just have this thing record and be done with it but we can also live broadcast here at the same time. So I'm going to check on that mark you can see the broadcast destinations that we have right now. At the moment, at least at the time that I'm recording this video, we can do YouTube and Facebook. You can't do them simultaneously though. You have to do one or the other, uh, but soon it will support, as you can see here, additional RTMP sources. So once that RTMP is enabled, you could probably send your stream to one of those aggregation sites that will uh, transmit to multiple video sources for you. At the moment, it doesn't do that, but it looks like that is their plan to get that working in the near future. So I'm going to just run a quick speed test here. You can see the upload speed has an option to be tested there at the bottom of the screen. So we're going to run that upload speed here. It'll give us an idea as to what kind of upstream bandwidth I can expect at my current location given current conditions. It's rating me at about 13 megabits per second. So I could probably get away with this 8 megabits per second program output bit rate but I could dial it down for example if I'm seeing that I have some bandwidth issues and I want to play it safe. I do believe that this program output bit rate when you're live streaming is the same bit rate that will be recorded to the disc or the card. Uh, so if you really want the best possible recording, my advice would be uh, to turn off the live streaming. Not ideal, but you could probably broadcast through another device if you wish. Uh, and that way you could, for example, here get the maximum 16 megabits per second, uh, both for your video sources and your output bit rate. Um, so there is a bit of a mix there between the program output when you're live streaming and the video sources. Another thing I suggest doing before you get started is to check your camera connectivity. So if we go over here to check now at the top, uh, you'll see we get a really nice and robust look at uh, what our cameras are currently doing. So for example, my um, signal strength here looks pretty good from all of my cameras to the device itself. It's also checking to see what the Wi-Fi congestion is on the network. So you can see up top there, it's showing that the congestion is low. So it's not picking up anything interfering with where we're at right now. And we can see what percentage of the hotspot bandwidth we're currently using from each camera. Um, so really robust information here that you can get for when you're setting everything up. So there are no surprises when you actually begin to do your broadcast. One thing to keep in mind with Wi-Fi though is that human beings tend to absorb Wi-Fi radio signals. So um, you definitely want to maybe try some things when you've got people in the venue that you're going to be broadcasting from to at least simulate uh, what it might be when the room is filled up with people. So do some testing, but you've got some really great ways to do all of that here. So I'm going to back out of this menu now because we are good to go. Everything's going to record to where we want it to be. And you can see here now I've got uh, the live control panel up and running here. And uh, what I'm going to do now is pull up my uh, two up view here. So you can see me operating the switcher here as well as seeing what the output is going to be. So in the upper right hand corner there is the actual program output from the Sling Studio right now. I've got it running uh, with its HDMI output so we can simulate what we might see on the recording or on the live stream. And then I'll be able to interact with that program feed using the iPad control panel. Right now there is only an iPad control panel. It does not work with Android devices. Now you'll see here we are missing an input because one of my devices is currently off. So what I'm going to do first here is bring my iPhone 7 Plus into the mix here. It's connected already to the Sling Wi-Fi. I'm going to load up the Sling Studio Capture app. 
And in a second here, this should come alive here. And now uh, that camera is accessible to the mix here and I can start moving some things around. What's really cool is that the user of the camera gets a tally light so you know if you're on air or not. You can do some focusing. It's not perfect yet, but uh, you can tap to focus on the camera side of things. You also have the ability here to adjust the exposure. This is pretty much it. There is a zoom function to it also, which will give you kind of a uh, digital zoom. I don't think it's using the iPhone 7 uh, plus dual cameras. So I think it's just working off of the uh, the uh, wider angle lens, unfortunately, but I'm sure they can improve that over time. And I also really like having that tally light up there. Now, if I want to put this iPhone 7 on air, I've got a couple different ways to do it. I can just double tap here and that will immediately make it available to the program feed. Uh, likewise, I could maybe switch back to our other feed here by tapping on it first to put it into preview. And then I can click on preview to program to do a cut that way. Uh, there's also some other options here. I could do a dissolve if I want. So I could maybe dissolve back to this just by dragging it in there and then clicking preview to program. So it'll take whatever's in preview and move it to program here for our on air recording. Now, one thing that I've noticed is that there is a pretty sizable buffer on this. So as you're doing your production, especially for sporting events, you'll want to keep an eye on your iPad and not on the action itself because there is probably about a second or so of, of delay, of buffering uh, between what actually happens versus what shows up on your iPads. So if you're trying to get your timing precise, uh, you definitely want to time everything based on your iPad screen here uh, and not on uh, what you're seeing with your eyes out there because as you'll see here, there is a, a pretty sizable buffer between the time that I uh, actually do something here on, on, the, on my main system versus when you see it showing up uh, through the Sling Studio here. So just a little bit of a delay. Now it is possible to do some limited picture in picture as well as titling with this. Let me show you the picture in picture first. So the preview window is actually pretty important because this is where you're going to be doing a lot of this kind of stuff. So uh, on the left hand side of the preview window here, you've got two titling options and the picture in picture icon. So I'm going to click on that first and you can see we've got uh, an option here for one, two, three, four, or picture in picture. So if I go to four, it's going to allow me to drag in uh, multiple sources and I can pull all four things up at the same time. Looks like I got a duplicate there. I can put the iPad into the mix there and go from there. If I want to keep that, I check that off. I can then send it over to program and we've got uh, up on our program feed a full uh, four up view if we want that. But uh, if I want to make something simpler, what I can do here is just go back to the picture in picture, go back to single screen mode, uh, preview that to program and I'm back to where I started from. Now, if you want to do something smaller, like having something in a box, you can select PIP and you've got this little thing you can move around here and resize. Unfortunately, you can't crop this right now. So you can't uh, trim off the edges of this, for example. You're just kind of stuck with a, a window here that will be the full aspect ratio and you can't really adjust anything. Uh, but I can put that one there and put this one behind it, hit the checkbox there, and then uh, again, preview that one to program. And now we've got uh, this on screen. You can't move the picture in picture around in program, but I can do it uh, in the preview mode here. So if I go back to the edit icon there, I can move this around again, uh, lock it in, uh, send it back to program. And now we've got uh, that picture in picture in a different spot. And there are a few other options also. So for example, I can go in here and layer in uh, three sources together. So I can drop another one in here and one in there and I can adjust the border here. But again, you really can't do much cropping here beyond uh, adjusting these sizes, but it's still fairly limited. I would have loved to have been able to have more flexibility with this or uh, maybe run a background on it, kind of like what I'm doing right now in this video with my TriCaster where I can have uh, two windows scaled down with something playing behind it. But one thing they have added to the software over the last two weeks or so is the ability to bring in your own graphics. So let me show you how to do that. So if I go over here to the graphics menu, I can scroll down to uh, this lower third that I made earlier in my photo editing application. This is a transparent PNG file. And you can see here, it's already brought it up. And if I switch over to our main view here, let me do the two up first. Uh, you can see that uh, go to live here. And if you look at the main uh, screen here, you can see that that yellow bar there is transparent and it also has a good uh, alpha channel around the antennas from my logo. Pretty clean graphic here. And that was something that I put together in Photoshop essentially. Actually, I actually used a Pixelmator on the Mac and I was able to bring it right into the app here through the SD card and on the SD card on the device actually. And it was able to uh, integrate that pretty seamlessly. Uh, when it came in initially, it was kind of sized down a little bit, but if you just click on that uh, icon there, it will make it full size and you can uh, drop it in as you go. So you can select different graphics here. You can even have two on screen at once if you want. 
uh, then just preview that to program here just like you did before and it will put those graphics on air. Uh, likewise, there is a way to uh, put your own text in if you want. So they have some active text that you can put in here. Let me get rid of the other uh, graphic here first and then you can see we've got a text window up here now. I can adjust the color of this to make it fit with whatever I am doing and uh, you can make some adjustments that way. They also have a way that you can uh, put some text over a uh, existing graphic for example. So they have some presets here that you can type some things in to get uh, some basic lower thirds going. So you can make your own or you can use some stuff that they've already included in the package here, but uh, very nice to see that that's integrated here and fairly easy to use. And they also have a fairly robust audio mixer here because it can take audio from any of your input sources, including the line ins. You do have a lot of options as to what you want to have come on air. Uh, so what happens on the default mode here is that it sets every mode to follow. That's what that AFV stands for. So for example, if I were to uh, bring my iPhone into the mix here, you can see that the iPhone uh, just lit up there because before we weren't hearing it, but now that it's on the program feed, we are, and that's because AFV is set to on. Uh, likewise, I could just leave it on here all the time. And then if I switch back to my camera link here, you can see that both audio sources are currently lit up because the iPhone is always on, whereas the camera link is set to follow. So this is what you might do uh, out in the field. Maybe have your main audio feed for your play-by-play uh, -play announcer. And then if you switch to an interview, rather than having to jump into the mixer here, you can set your remote camera link here to be AFV so that when that camera is live, you get its audio and then when they're done talking and you switch back to uh, something else, that audio disables. Now, if you don't want to have any audio on at all from a particular source, you can just click on the little speaker icons here and shut them off permanently. So they're either on for everything or they're followed or they're just off. And you can adjust all of that on the fly during your recording. Now, one of the things that I really like about the system here is that it's constantly monitoring the health of the wireless devices. So if I pull up my iPad view here again, you can see we've got a signal strength indicator and a battery indicator next to each of the wireless connections that we currently have back to the system here. So you can very quickly decide uh, who might need a new battery. So my iPhone here at the bottom there is looking like it's starting to die. So maybe that is uh, the person I send the intern out to with the uh, battery for an extra boost. They also have a dashboard here that is accessible on the side menu. You can just push this little button here to pull it up very quickly. It just overlays on top of what you're looking at and you can get a more granular look at everything, including the uh, current bit rate coming out of each phone and its connection quality. So I thought that was really cool. So you can see how much bandwidth we're uh, using on the wireless hotspot there. You also can see how much recording time you have left and of course an advertisement to buy the Sling Studio battery <laughs> if you want that. It also monitors your internet connection too. So you've got a pretty good at a glance view as to uh, what is going on with your network. Now you'll recall when we set up the SD card earlier, we did uh, ask our Sling Studio to record everything it possibly could. And I'm going to hit the record button now and show you what it's going to grab. So you can see here, it's got a record icon next to every single incoming video source as well as the program feed. And when this is done recording, I can take this card out and not only have a completed production with all of my live switches, but again, all of the uh, separate input sources that we recorded too. It's really pretty flexible uh, in what you can grab. So you can do some additional work later on the production after your live stream is over with. I can also click that go live button right now and start going out to Facebook or YouTube uh, at the same time that I'm recording. It can do all of that uh, inside the box here. So that works uh, fairly well. So you're probably wondering what the output quality of this device is. Well, you're looking at it right now. I'm recording live to the switcher as we speak. I have audio going via line in uh, with video coming in via the HDMI, and it seems like it works okay. Uh, the big thing here is that I'm at the 16 megabit per second mode because I'm not streaming live. You might see a recording reduction if you are streaming at the lower bit rate. If you want to see what a live stream looks like, I've got, I think, an 8 megabit per second stream uh, linked down below in the video video description from what I did the other day with it. But let's play around here. Let's pull up some graphics. I'll pull up that graphic that I showed you earlier here. So let me go over here and uh, click on it and uh, add in my other source here. It's still a little clunky to try to get uh, all these things put together during a live production, but I'm getting there. So we'll drop in my uh, video image here and then preview that to program so you can see uh, what it looks like here. So there is my lower third. I can maybe switch to uh, my iPhone camera here so we can get a feel for how well it matches up my audio with what's coming in via the line in as well as the HDMI. So we have that. And then we'll come back to me here and that is what it looks like. So I'm going to stop the recording now. Let's take a look at the card and see how it stores all of these recordings for us. 
So I've got the card inserted into my Mac now, and this would look the same on Windows and other operating systems. And inside of the card is a folder called Sling Studio. I can then uh, jump into the projects here, and you can see the test recording project that uh, we've been working with throughout this review. Now in the program recordings folder is where you'll find uh, the full production of what you just did. So for example, that recording that you just watched uh, is this file here, and you can see as I scrub through, it's got uh, the, the different switches that happen there along with the lower third. But if I back out of here and go down a level, you can see that there are some uh, input recordings here also. So I've got the input from my HDMI here. I also have the input from my phone. So that last recording that we did I have me talking here, but there's no switching or graphics going on because it recorded whatever came out of that iPhone. It also gets the audio off the iPhone and not the main program recording, but it does capture my uh, line in that I had for uh, this most recent recording here. So I have an audio file here. I've got separate recordings with audio from each input device, and it's labeled by the device that uh, came into it. But one thing I did notice was that both iPhones ended up having their content put into the same folder because the iPhones are both called the same thing. They're both called Lon's iPhone. So if I jump in here, uh, you'll see that I've got footage from the uh, iPhone 7 here along with footage from the iPhone 6. No big deal, but if you uh, have two devices with the same name, they'll be lumped into the same folder. So you probably want to rename them there. So now that you've seen how this works, what's the verdict on the Sling Studio? Well, I have to say, I've really enjoyed playing with this thing over the last couple of weeks, more so than I thought I would. I thought this wireless thing was going to be a nightmare to manage, but it really does bring in some pretty decent video quality from the phones that you attach to it. Uh, the HDMI transmitter device, while expensive, does seem to do a very nice job of bringing over uh, video from my camcorders with minimal loss of quality. All in, it really does work pretty nicely. And I think if you're in a situation where you're, uh, again, recording sporting events or uh, worship services, and you've got a single lockdown camera right now, I think this will add a new compelling uh, feature for your viewers to enjoy where you can send out cameras and get them closer to the action or get them over to interview somebody after an amazing play. You can really bring an ounce of professionalism to your uh, production that I think will surprise people and probably delight your audience in the process. I think that's one of the key things here. This is why I think this really is something not well suited for people that sit in a studio all day like me, but for people that are covering live events and uh, don't need some $50 million piece of equipment, but want to do it on the cheap. This actually will get the job done, and I think viewers will appreciate having something different to look at other than a single lockdown camera. But it is not a perfect product, of course. There are some things that you need to keep in mind. Uh, the biggest thing is battery life of everything. Not only the battery you might get for this, but the battery for the camera transmitter, the battery on the camera itself, the batteries on your iPhones, even the iPad control surface will be uh, draining at a pretty good rate. So my iPad was at 100%, and about two and a half hours later, it's down to about 39% right now, just for the control surface. So all of this stuff takes a lot of juice out of your devices, and you need to manage that. The good thing, though, as I mentioned earlier, is that it does give you a nice control panel for seeing all of the battery life uh, statuses of your devices, so you can see when one is running low and maybe run a battery out to somebody, but my advice would be to lock down a camera, have it plugged in, connected via HDMI, so you always have a safe shot to go to in case one of your remote cameras goes down, because I think it'll be highly likely that you'll have uh, battery issues, especially over the course of a basketball or soccer game or something like that. Uh, so that was the first issue with it. The interface could use a little work. It's still a little clunky to me. I'd like to have more uh, kind of macro controls where I can just hit a button and do some things versus having to keep calling everything up into preview and everything. So there's ways to quickly switch, but I think they could probably improve the interface a little bit and just make it a faster experience, especially for bringing in uh, graphics and other things. I also noticed that there was a little bit of audio synchronization delay on that sample that I just showed you. So it, certain times it'll be okay, other times it might be off a little bit depending on what equipment you're using. So having some audio delay controls I think would be uh, helpful within the audio mixer. These are all software fixable things. Also that scaling thing that I brought up earlier. The other thing to keep in mind is where you'll be using it because if you've got a lot of Wi-Fi going in the area that you're shooting, uh, this will certainly run into some interference. Now, the good news is it's using wireless AC, which is less frequently used, but uh, you might still find yourself in an urban environment where there's a lot of Wi-Fi around that will be uh, making it more difficult for your cameras to connect back to the box here and for the box to uh, transmit reliably out to the internet. So anytime you can get this on Ethernet for its outgoing connection, I recommend you do that. And then I would certainly take it out to
to where you're going to be using it first and have it run its little wireless frequency survey to make sure that there's not a lot of interference that might screw up your production because uh, this is relying on unregulated Wi-Fi space and anybody can set up a Wi-Fi radio nearby that might interfere with your performance here. But if you have a pretty clean area for Wi-Fi, I think it's going to work very well. So I'm quite pleased with this thing. Again, I'm not going to use this in my studio environment. I think it's better suited for areas where you're trying to cover a pretty large geographic area, for example, and want to get uh, cameras closer to the action. But I think it's really Really compelling for that use case and definitely worth taking a look at. Do leave me some questions and comments down below and I will try to answer as many as I can. I'll hold on to this for another week or two so if we want to do a follow-up to answer something more in depth I will do so as well. So let me know what you think and this is Lon Seidman. Thanks for watching. This channel is brought to you by my Patreon supporters including Gold Level supporter Cody Falk. If you want to help the channel you can by contributing as little as a dollar a month. Head over to lon.tv slash Patreon to learn more. And don't forget to subscribe. Visit lon.tv slash s.